Good morning, everyone. My name is Sheila Barrett Carroll. I'm a graphic designer with the Historic Research Office and Publications uh, with the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. Happy January 2021. Welcome to Flyleaf, our Facebook Live Q&A. I am delighted and honored to introduce our guests, Dr. Tamara Holmes Brothers and Dr. Ruth Little to talk about the history and origins of the Bovrilloan village, which began as a free African-American settlement on the outskirts of Raleigh. Dr. Little's article, Rooted in Freedom, Raleigh, North Carolina's Freedman Village of Oberlin, an antebellum free black enclave was published in the October 2020 North Carolina Historical Review. Dr. Ruth Little grew up in Fayetteville and studied at UNC Chapel Hill. She went on to earn a PhD in the history of art and architecture for four decades, and for four decades, I'm sorry, has taught and wrote about Art and Architecture of North Carolina. She established Longleaf Historic Resources, a historic preservation consulting firm in Raleigh in 1990 to provide preservation services to owners, advocates, and developers of historic properties and to the public sector. She is the author of nine books on North Carolina architecture and decorative arts, including Cameron Village, North Carolina, a remote retreat on Hillsborough Street, 1910 through 2010, Carolina Cottage, A Personal History of the Piazza House, and Sticks and Stones, Three Centuries of North Carolina Grave Markers. Our moderator, Dr. Tamara Holmes Brothers, is also from Fayetteville and has experience in the fine and performing arts, grassroots marketing, and governance in quantifying the value and brand and philanthropic outcomes. Dr. Tamara Holmes Brothers was appointed Deputy Director of the North Carolina Arts Council in April 2020 and is the Vice Chair and Commissioner of the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission. Dr. Brothers is charged with the design development and implementation of agency programs, recommends policies that realize the agency's mission of Arts for All People, Dr. Brothers leads the work of assessing the effectiveness of institutional equity, diversity goals, and outreach efforts. She works closely with the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources leader and other state and national arts organizations to prioritize and define strategies that deliver resources to arts organizations and artists to encourage projects and programs of public value. Again, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Ruth Little and Dr. Tamara Holmes Brothers to talk with us today about the origins of Oberlin Village as a free African-American settlement on the outskirts of Raleigh. Thank you. So I will be turning over the conversation to Dr. Brothers, she will be opening and closing the conversation. I thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy this time. We have plenty of graphics and I know that Dr. Little uh, will provide an interesting conversation. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you, Sheila, so much for that warm introduction. And thank you, Dr. Little, for being here with us today to talk a bit about your, your research. Before we start on the questions, I'd like to give our listeners a brief excerpt of your article. You write, new research has revealed a previously unknown chapter of Oberlin's history. It is no ordinary freedman town, but an antebellum free black enclave that grew into an African-American municipality built away from white supervision by former slaves free during or after the Civil War. Because it was rooted in freedom, Overland Village provided a legacy of freedom and land ownership, creating an enduring black settlement with an elevated degree of home ownership, artisanal pride, 
and an irreproachable reputation. Censuses, deeds, estate papers, and an eyewitness account weave a rich story of a unique black town in Raleigh's outskirts. I think this is a great segue into learning a lot from you in regards to how you became interested in the history of, of Overland Village. Tamara, thank you for asking. I'm so happy to be part of this conversation. It's, it's wonderful to work with you and with Sheila Carroll, the graphic designer who just introduced me. I moved into Overland Village in 2006, uh, downsizing, empty nesting. And because I, I can call myself the gravestone queen because of the, the book Sticks and Stones that was mentioned in the introduction about grave markers all over North Carolina, I decided that I wanted to work on my neighborhood and there, there was a very old cemetery, very neglected behind the Oberlin Baptist Church on Oberlin Road, the Oberlin Cemetery. And so I decided I would have it designated as a Raleigh Historic Landmark, mm -hmm. which I did. And then with two other neighborhood activists, we formed an advocacy group for Oberlin Village called the Friends of Oberlin Incorporated. And subsequent, subsequent to that, uh, I created a historic district here working with the city of Raleigh so that we could try to protect the character that we had left, the older buildings and the, the landscape resources that we had left from encroaching development because Cameron Village, which is nearby, is uh, one of the epicenters of growth here in West Raleigh. Then in 2018, I thought, I was hired, actually hired to put the cemetery on the National Register of Historic Places. And I thought, okay, I'm getting paid for this. I'm gonna take some time to answer a very fundamental question, which I had never understood about Oberlin Village, which is that people always said that it, that the Cameron, there was a, the Duncan Cameron lived nearby, that Duncan Cameron created Cameron Village by giving his freed slaves home sites along Overland Road. So, okay, I'm gonna take a little time here because I'm getting paid for this and see whether I can prove this oral tradition or not. Mm. And the way I started was with looking in the deeds for, uh, it, at the end of the Civil War, Duncan Cameron was dead. His daughter, Margaret Cameron, had inherited all of his Raleigh property and she had married George Mordecai from the Mordecai Plantation here in Raleigh, who was the president of the state bank and a very rich man. So it was an alliance of um, two of the richest families in the, in the state. So I, I looked for Duncan Cameron's deeds. Was he, what, who was he transferring land to in Oberlin at the end of the Civil War? I didn't find any deed that to any African-American person, except in 1858, before the beginning of the Civil War, and that man was Jesse Pettiford. And that deed, uh, uh, George Mordecai sold 16 acres to Jesse Pettiford in 1858. Jesse Pettiford was a free black. And he is the reason that I wrote this article, Jesse mm. Pettiford. So it's a kind of homage to, to, to that legacy, if you will. Yes. So when and why was the name Oberlin chosen? In 1872, after many, many uh, African-Americans, Blacks had bought lots along Oberlin Road, they were being given names that were derogatory, like African colony. Uh, they were, it, it was called save rent, which meant that you, you, it was a scheme that many new towns had where you could rent to own. Nothing that actually celebrated the fact that it was a, a free black town. And so they wrote letters to newspapers asked, uh, asking if they would call their settlement Oberlin in 1872. And it was based primarily on a connection with James Harris, who was one of the promoters of Oberlin, a black man, 
had, had gone to or lived in Oberlin College in Ohio before the Civil mm. War. That's so interesting. So as you were doing your, your research and of course coming across some oral history, in an oral interview, Frank James Flagg, an elderly Oberlin resident born in the early 20th century states that their or original Oberlin property was given to black people by a wealthy white person in the 1860s. Your research indicates this statement is incorrect. Can you talk a bit about why this oral tradition persisted? I've thought so much about that and it, because it seems counterproductive for uh, the people of Oberlin to give credit to a slave owner, a slave owner who owned over 1,000 slaves. Um, it was considered a medieval lord in North Carolina. Why did they say that he was their benefactor? And all I can think of is that there are one or two, there are one or two Cameron slaves who lived in Oberlin Village but I found out about more or less how they got the property. And it was not uh, after the Civil War, it was later in the 1800s. And I, th I think that just one person may have remembered uh, that his grandmother was given a lot by the Camerons and thinks that the Camerons benefited the whole village. But oral, oral tradition is an odd thing. And there was a, a real disconnect, I think, between the memory of 20th century Oberlin Village people and what happened in the 1800s, and especially a big break between the Civil War and pre-Civil War Raleigh. Now, you mentioned a little earlier in our the beginning of our conversation about um, Cameron and Mordecai families. Can you tell us a bit more about those two families? <clears throat> Duncan Cameron uh, the, the, uh, ruled over thousands and thousands and thousands of acres in North Carolina, primarily in Orange County, where Chapel Hill is, and in uh, some plantations in Wake County, just a few. But primarily, most of his 1,000 slaves worked on plantations in Orange County named Stagville and Farintosh. And both of them are state historic sites now. Mm -hmm. They're also now in Durham County. Um, it used to be Orange County. When, when Cameron died in 1853, he gave all his property in Raleigh in Wake County to his daughter, Margaret. And she married the same year that Duncan died, she married George Mordecai. And they became a, a power couple, if you will, in Raleigh. Margaret inherited from her father in 1853 100 slaves, okay. in, which included 24 slaves at their house on St. Mary's Street across from St. Mary's College. They were house slaves. There don't appear to have been any other slaves in West Raleigh that belonged to the Camerons. And we know exactly who these slaves were because they're recorded in Margaret's account books for that period of time. Um, George married, George died in 1871 and Margaret lived until 1886. Did I answer that question? Yes. <laughs> so in thinking about um, the, the power couple and, and their, their unity, how did these two families um, play a part in Oberlin's history? Well, there's, a, there's an incredible story about one of the 24 house slaves named Mary Walker, mm -hmm. who escaped on a trip to Philadelphia. She was a nurse. Her job was to be nurse to one of Cameron's daughters who lived here in Raleigh. And while on a, a trip to, to, at, uh, to Philadelphia to a, a clinic, she escaped Duncan Cameron and, be, and, and hid away for the rest of, until that was, uh, that was in 1834. 
Okay. And she hid away from and escaped all attempts by Duncan Cameron to get her back. And finally, in 1865, when freedom came, um, Sherman came to Raleigh and freed all the slaves and her two children, whom she'd been trying to buy from Duncan Cameron, and he would never sell them. Her two children were finally freed. Um, so the Camerons never freed any of their slaves, although they were, they were very kind to the slaves. They taught the slaves. All of their house slaves here in Raleigh, you know, had uh, lives that were far, far better than farm slaves, plantation slaves. And I believe that Margaret Cameron was a very good slave mistress, but she never freed anyone. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that uh, Mary Walker was an enslaved um, being within the, the Cameron family and she fled her owners during a stay in Philadelphia. What other information did you learn about her life in the Philadelphia area in later Cambridge, Cambridge Massachusetts? Uh, she had to hide. She was protected by abolitionists. Okay. She, uh, she, was, she was safe in their houses, but it was a constant battle to keep from being, uh, to, from, from her being snatched by Duncan Cameron's mm. slave uh, hunters to, 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 to go back. She was really the bane of C Duncan Cameron's life. Good for her. Um, <laughs> There's the, 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 the book that I found all this from, I'd like to, to let people know, is by Sidney Nathans, who's a very important uh, uh, historian in Orange County of the Cameron family. And it's called To Free a Family, The Journey of Mary Walker, published in 2012 by Harvard University Press. Mm. That's so interesting. Thank you for, for sharing the title of that publication. And you talked about Mary Walker's children that were still enslaved in North Carolina. Can you talk to us a bit about when they were able to join her, their mother? Well, a Bryant, her son Bryant and her daughter mm -hmm. Agnes uh, were both grown and had married by the time freedom came. And so they, they moved up there several months later uh, but it was a little bit complicated because they had families here. But they, they remained in Cambridge where her mother was, their mother was living mm -hmm. until their mother died in 1872. Mm. So it was wonderful for them to still have the opportunity to, to join her in freedom before her passing. It really is an amazing story. Yeah, thank you for that. You also mentioned uh, Jesse Pettiford. And can you tell us why he's considered the founder of Oberlin? Jesse uh, is from an illustrious line of free blacks who grew up on the border between Virginia and North Carolina in Granville County. His father, Drury Pettiford, was a free black soldier in the Revolutionary War uh, as a patriot fighting for the United States. Uh, Jesse uh, bought this 16 acres from George Mordecai in 1858. He had five or six children living with him and his wife. His son, uh, Roscoe Ross, uh, was grown at that time because Jesse was an old man. He was 68 years old when he bought the property. Mm. He was a farmer and uh, his, the way that I found out about uh, the, what, what was here in the area before the end of the Civil War is that there was Jesse on his 16 acres. And when I looked in the 1860 census, there was a group of free blacks who all lived uh, beside each other. And if the, the second slide could go up on the screen, Okay, that's, that is a rolling village. This is the second slide. I don't know if you can see all of it, but there are a group of five free black families who all live side by side as the census taker went down in 1860. There was Jesse Pettiford's household. Benjamin Morgan lived right across the street with his family, a free black man. And then three other families, the Manuals, uh, the 
um, forgotten the name of the, uh, the third family. And then Jesse Pettiford's son had a separate household. And then if you'll go to the next slide, we have two maps of Oberlin Village made during the Civil War that show this settlement with the names of the, the free black um, families who owned property. The um, first map here is from 1863 and it was drawn by the Confederates. And you see the dark, uh, the dark line at the lower right corner of the map. Those are the Confederate fortifications to keep the Yankees from invading Raleigh. So this uh, black free black settlement is just outside the federal, the, the Confederate fortifications. And on the map, you can see the Pettifords, Pettiford lot, lots there, free um, cleared farms, two farms, Jesse Pettiford and his son Roscoe's. And then across the street, you see the Benjamin Morgan farm. Mm. So there is the settlement in 1863 and it shows uh, I don't know if you can see the whole image, but we see land owned by white settlers further down this road, which is Oberlin Road. And then the next map, if you'll show. Um, okay. The next map shows, these are, this is a, a detail on the left, the yellow map is a detail of that settlement. And you can see a red triangle, a uh, cross hatched red triangle overlaying the Pettiford property that are the boundaries of Oberlin Cemetery. Mm -hmm. So we know that, that the Pettifords and the Morgans lived right there on both sides of Oberlin Road where Oberlin Village is right now. Okay. This, uh, the map on the right is the same property. Uh, the dotted line shows Pettiford's property. And there's the rectangle that is Oberlin Cemetery. I think certainly having these these accompanied images helps to, to tell the story as well. Thank you for, for supplying those for us. In your research, you also write, in 1880, Oberlin's reputation as an industrious colony, excuse me, derived from its high number of artisans and other tradesmen who commuted to the town two miles or so away by horseback or horse-drawn wagon. You also note that two thirds of the men worked as artisans and service workers. One third of the men and a few women in the rural town worked as farm laborers. How did these skilled craftsmen, blacksmiths, stone and brick masons, shoemakers, carpenters and tenors learn their trades? That's a great question. In, when Arbolin was first the village was first founded in, 18, in the early 1870s. Many of the men and women would have been slaves, were freed slaves, who learned their occupations, their trades, their crafts as slaves because okay. of a, um, an educated slave, a slave who was clever with his hands, a carpenter, a stonemason, was a very valuable slave for a slave owner to own. And a number of slave owners were craftsmen themselves. For example, there's a, a famous gravestone carver, William Stronach in Raleigh, who came in to help build the state capitol in the 1830s. And he stayed here and it, it, most of his work was carving gravestones. And he had a slave named Stronach who also carved gravestones and signed them and there's, there's one of those signed gravestones in the Black Cemetery, Mount Hope Cemetery in downtown Raleigh. Uh, the other, uh, this, these slave artisans would have passed their, their passions and their craft onto their sons and daughters. And so these artisans, these black artisans were the most important um, force, I think, in, in free blacks and in uh, enslaved blacks, and then after the Civil War in blacks in general. So would you say with a lot of these artisans um, learning their crafts as a part of an apprenticeship from some of those, those white artisans? Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay, we'll go on to our next question. In 1880, 
the Raleigh City Directory wrote of Oberlin Village, quite a town composed almost entirely of colored people has grown up a mile northwest of the city. The length is more than a mile and it has some 750 inhabitants. It has been given the name Oberlin. The houses are almost entirely of wood, but little stone or brick being used in the construction of the dwellings. An ample space is given each dwelling and this causes the city to cover much ground. This positive description contrasts with the white newspaper accountings during the 1870s, which often referred to the settlement by incorrect or derogatory names, such as San Domingo, Morganton, or Save Rent, as you mentioned earlier. How did Oberlin's relationship with white people and institutions change over time? A great question. The, the newspapers in the 1870s, which was the Reconstruction era, mm -hmm. when the federal government was making a valiant effort to, uh, to, to give uh, freed black slaves equal rights, equal representation, they became citizens of the United States, they were given the vote. It was extremely turbulent because the, the, the white Confederates who had been defeated but had not gone away were determined to keep blacks down and not give them equal rights. And they certainly didn't wanna give up any political power to blacks. So there were uh, conservative Republican newspapers in North Carolina, white newspapers, and there were black newspapers. And the white newspapers, most of them uh, were, were determined to not give Oberlin Village any credit as, as, a, as a way that uh, Blacks were uplifting themselves and called them by uh, very derogatory names. Um, however, Oberlin, Oberlin's founders were solid citizens. They were, they, they were family people. They had uh, crafts such as many of them were carpenters, many of them were stonemasons. There were draymen, there were people who worked for uh, newspaper companies, um, there were ministers, there were teachers. They kept on, they kept their heads to the ground. They, many of them owned their own houses. Um, they interacted very closely with whites that lived around them, white people. They went back and forth a, a mile and a half down into Raleigh. And over the decades, they earned a great deal of respect from white Raleigh citizens. And everyone considered Oberlin Village to be um, the, uh, it, a had a reputation of having no crime. It, it just, it, was, it, it established the first school, public school in Raleigh, Oberlin Public School right there in Oberlin. It was segregated, mm -hmm. but it was a public school uh, in eight, the early 1880s. And gradually people saw that the truth of Oberlin is that it was a very fun, upstanding, segregated area that thrived under Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's so important to, to note. And what other free black communities were in Raleigh and where were they located? In 1860, Raleigh had 466 mm -hmm. free blacks. And uh, one third of Raleigh's population was, were, were slaves. So uh, <clears throat> the free blacks were about 3% of Raleigh's population. And I'm talking about the boundaries of Raleigh, which were very small at that point. In Raleigh, the free blacks lived in small groups. Uh, they uh, a number of them owned their own homes and they lived uh, near each other, whereas slaves lived with their slave owners all over Raleigh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a, uh, Southeast Raleigh had uh, the largest free black settlement as, and it of course is traditionally considered to be the seat of black power in, in Raleigh. Uh, around St. Paul AME Church, in Northwest Raleigh, which is at the corner of Harrington 
and Edenton Streets, northwest of the Capitol. That was the largest black church, St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church. And there was a, 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 a settlement of free blacks around there. Thank you. I think when you're, you're writing about the village of Oberlin, it's important to note the significance of, of black home ownership. I know for myself, I am a fourth generation home owner and becoming a, a black homeowner is more than just owning the, the physical property. It's laying a foundation for, for building generational wealth and family and financial security. So thank you so much for, for bringing that to our attention. We'll go to our next question. James Henry Harris was a delegate to the Freedmen's Convention in Raleigh in 1865 and was one of 20 black legislators in the 1868 to 1870 North Carolina General Assembly when the Republican party held power. What was his role in developing Overland Village? James Henry Harris is considered the most uh, in influential black leader in North Carolina from, from the end of the Civil War until he died in the 1880s. Um, Willis Briggs was a lawyer in Raleigh who wrote the only eyewitness account about Oberlin Village in 1948. It took up an entire page of the Raleigh News and Observer. And he, Willis was the grandson of Thomas Briggs, of, of Briggs Hardware, and Thomas Briggs was also probably Raleigh's biggest builder. Uh, and Willis Briggs knew these, Willis Briggs was, was born probably in the 1860s, 1850s, so he knew uh, personally, a number of Oberlin people, and he 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 claims that uh, Henry James Henry Harris, who did not live in Oberlin but was a promoter of Oberlin, was the first Raleigh developer to give loans to blacks to buy property and build houses. Harris partnered up with the principal of St. Augustine's College in East Raleigh, who was a white. Episcopal minister, and they created a, the Raleigh Cooperative Land and Building Association in 1869, which lasted throughout Reconstruction until about 1880. And it didn't just give house mortgages, it, it loaned Blacks money to buy land. It's considered to be the first um, mortgage cooperative in in North Carolina, I think I'm saying that right, it was a very early mortgage cooperative. And James Henry Harris being, uh, uh, have, having dedicated his life to the betterment of his own black people, wanted blacks to be able to buy and land and own build houses just like whites did. And I think you had an image of, uh, was it Reverend Wilson? That you had, did you want to show the audience that, that image? Yes, that's sure. Go ahead. Next image. Um, this is the only, only photograph that I was able to find of any African Americans who had anything to do with Oberlin Village. Mm -hmm. This, this is Wilson, the Reverend Wilson W. Morgan, who was the brother of Benjamin Morgan, who was one of the free blacks who lived in the Oberlin Village area before the Civil War. Now, Wilson Morgan lived down in Southeast Raleigh, but he had, he was very much connected with Oberlin Village. And in 1860, hmm, maybe 1867 or 68, he donated the land where Wilson Temple, named for Reverend Wilson, stands today. Um, it's one of two churches in Oberlin Village, the Baptist Church and then Wilson Temple, which is the Methodist Church. And here's the photograph of Reverend Wilson W. Morgan, who is a, a, a wonderful man. And uh, we have two strong uh, leaders in the Friends of Oberlin Village who live here today, Three, uh, two of them who live here today, and one who, who, who is our president, Sabrina Good is a Morgan, 
Uh, Karen Throckmorton lives here in Overland Village. She's a, uh, a, a Morgan. And right down the street from me on Bedford Avenue is Joyce Morgan. Oh, well, how wonderful. I think this, again, shows that um, the members of that community were, were, of course, artisans in their own right, and they were very involved in leadership within their immediate communities and within the state as a testament to, to this image. I think there's also an image of, of the church as well. Did you yes. want to show that too? Yes, there's, there's uh, 19, built in 1912, the second church of uh, Wilson Temple. And this is where the first school was set up in the mm -hmm. late 1860s inside the church. Thank you for, for displaying that, that image. In 1880, there were 130 black households in Overland Village. How many descendants of these families remain in, in Overland Village today? You mentioned some descendants from, from the Morgan family. Are there others? I, I keep finding more. Uh, what, what, actually <laughs> well, happened, <laughs> what actually happened is that beginning with the Great Depression, which hit Overland Village um, homeowners very hard, as it hit everyone very hard, a lot of black families unfortunately lost their property in Oberlin at that time. There was the great migration uh, of Southern blacks who moved up North to escape uh, racism and to have a better life. And throughout the decades, uh, more and more black families as the uh, original generations died off, their children had moved out of North Carolina and the homes get sold off and redeveloped. But um, I'm going to talk about some of uh, the, the descendants of Oberlin Village pioneers who still live here. Cheryl Williams is the fifth generation of Turners to live in the Turner Home Place on Oberlin Road. That's the biggest big white house, two-story front porch right there on Oberlin Road. Randy Shepard descended from James Shepard, the Reverend James Shepard, Dr. Shepard who founded North Carolina Central University and grew up in Overland Village. Uh, he lives down the street from me here on Bedford Avenue. Uh, I just talked about the Morgans who still live here. Mabel Patterson, she's uh, uh, our local poet, retired school teacher, lives on Overland Road. Her father was the first black postmaster in Overland Village. Mm. And I'm, I'm finding more people all the time. Oh, wonderful. Friends of Oberlin Village has been uh, its outreach program, which has been helped by Preservation North Carolina's restoration of two of the uh, most important black houses on Oberlin Road. Uh, it's getting the word out across the country, and there is a diaspora of people who trace their roots back to Oberlin Village who are finding out that Oberlin Village is still here. That's wonderful. And I'm just speaking um, to myself. You mentioned um, two local historical black colleges and universities that have a connection to Overland Village. You just mentioned North Carolina Central University, and you recently mentioned uh, St. Augustine's University as well. I think it'd be a great way for the alumni to connect with that community as well, with the friends of, of Overland Village and supporting the overall um, historic preservation of, of that community. Um, this uh, Black History Matters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It certainly does, especially with North Carolina having the most historical Black colleges and universities in the country. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll go to our final question. There is a public art project on Overland Road called Overland Rising, dedicated in 2018. Can you tell us a bit about that? I would love to. Do we have some images we can show of that? Uh, Oberlin Rising is the, the front yard of the York Properties Building, which you can see at the back. No, I'm sorry. You're actually looking at Oberlin Baptist Church there across the street. But Smeed's York of York Properties, uh, who uh, former mayor of Raleigh, grew up uh, in Hayes Barton, just down Oberlin Road, and has since his childhood had a... a relationships with people in Oberlin Village. 
And as we were, uh, as the Friends of Eberlin Village were getting established and Smeeds was seeing that Oberlin was not going to disappear and not going to get torn down. <laughs> he decided to use the one acre front yard of his, uh, the York Properties building there on Oberlin Road as for a public park dedicated to Oberlin Village. And he hired Thomas Sayer, a landscape architect with Clearscapes Architecture here in Raleigh to design this one acre park. The first thing that Thomas Sayer did to get into the mood for uh, this public park was to visit Overland Cemetery. And there he saw a sign that said, please stay on the path and do not, do not walk off the path because most of the people buried here do not have grave markers. Mm -hmm. And he, that, that set him on a train of thought where he wanted this public park to be the memorials for all of the people in Oberlin Village who do not have grave markers. Mm. And they, his, his workmen uh, dug into the ground right there uh, on this piece of property and erected, I, I think there are five or seven earth pillars uh, to the memory of all of Oberlin's founders. And he, in, he, uh, in the wet clay, he, uh, they impressed symbols of the occupations of Oberlin's founders. So trowel marks for the stonemasons, uh, the teachers, they, uh, they impressed rulers into the wet clay and other, other symbols for these occupations. They also found the, the foundation lines of the two houses, the two Oberlin village houses that had been on this property and they erected low walls that you can sit on. So like you're sitting on the foundation of the house and there's poetry and, and names and words about Oberlin Village incised into the low walls. It's a very mm -hmm. special place. It sounds very special. And I'm actually familiar with, with the artists of, of Oberlin Rides and Thomas Sayre. He just so happens to be one of our board members for the North Carolina Arts Council. So I'll definitely have to take a, a trip to see not just the, the community, but the public art there as well. And hopefully we'll encourage our, our visitors to do a, a socially distant activity during this pandemic. And I hope our viewers will also venture to see a part of Raleigh, North Carolina's history and a part of American history. Thank you so much, Dr. Little, for spending time with me today and with our viewers to share the legacy of Overland Village. And we and thank I, you. I'm sorry, I, go ahead. I'd like to make one, 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 just to sum up everything I've said. Sure. Which is that I think I've proven that Overland Village is a unique Freedman's Village in North Carolina. There are others, but this one is unique because it's the only one that we know of that started out as a free black settlement before the slaves were freed. So it has that extra legacy of freedom in it. Well, thank you again so much in, in sharing in this legacy. And I hope you'll research some of those other communities as well and, and come back and share that information with us too. I hope to, that our viewers enjoyed the, the interview today and learning more about, about you, Dr. Little and about your, your research of Overland Village. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tamara.